welcome back to another fun-loving episode of Unfinished Business Television. Um, I am your host, Jeff Gallishaw. With me, as always, is my co-host, AJ Epics Productions, Andre Joseph's own. Aloha. <laughs> and with us, as you can see, we always have an extra screen, so that must mean we have a guest. So before we start, let me introduce our guest, who is always special. Mm. So this one is also a treat. You will definitely instantly recognize him, yet you will wonder where you know him from. If you have watched television or movies ever, you should only, he should definitely feel familiar. Um, he has worked steadily uh, for over four decades. He has guest starred or been a regular on almost every popular show since his career began, from the Golden Girls, Murphy Brown, Family Ties, Martin, The Saved by the Bell, The New Class, and also Mad Men in Good Trouble. And one of my favorite shows of all time, Brooklyn Bridge. And in films such as War Games, Inner Space, Ten Men, Pathology, The Ring, Prom Child 2, the list goes on, but those are just to name a few. Ladies and gentlemen, the chameleon who never had to change his look, character actor extraordinaire, Mr. Alan Blumenfeld. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. That was a very sweet introduction. I've never had to change my looks, nor have I really been able to. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alan, thank you for coming on and talking to us today. So, like we ask all of our guests, what got you started in the business? That's interesting. Um, so two answers. Uh, I knew from the time I was young, from the time I was probably 12, 14, um, maybe younger, 10, something like that, that I wanted to be an actor, which is amazing. Uh, I went to a camp, a summer camp. Uh, I'm from Long Island, and it was very common among us, uh, my friends and the people, uh, the the upper middle class and middle class Jews of Long Island to go away to summer camp. Uh, and, and I went every summer from the time I was seven to the time I was 16, 17. And it was a camp that had both sports and theater. And so and, you know, we had a, a show that every age group did. And I, I did a lot of musicals and all. Uh, one, one of the guys who directed me, I'm about to see him this weekend, he's directing, uh, has been directing for years, and he's directing shows at the at North Coast, um, which is a sort of North San Diego County. Uh, and I'm going down to see him. I haven't seen him in a, in a while. Anyway, um, so that was that. And then in high school, I did all the musicals. Uh, and then when I, I was in college, I realized I really want to do this for real. Studied in New York. Uh, and then I went to San Francisco to the American Conservatory Theater, where, uh, which really changed my life in a lot of ways, uh, from being in San Francisco, being exposed in the early 70s to a, a remarkable, progressive, uh, spectacularly open and aware community of artists and people. And uh, from there, I was very lucky and I, I worked pretty regularly uh, in theater, and I started doing film and television in San Francisco as well. So that's a short answer to how I got started. But it's something I've always knew I wanted to do and, and always have have been lucky enough to, to get to do. Is there um, any, yeah, go ahead, Joe. No, 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 you got it. <laughs> no, I, what I was gonna ask you, Alan, was, um, was there any memorable experience from your early days that you felt had a really significant impact in your career? Like any productions or anything that you did? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I remember at uh, when I was eight at camp, I did this show called The King Sneezes. I mean, I remember it now, I'm 71. Um, I just remember what that was, uh, the joy of doing that, of, of, of make-believe make with and in front of people. I, I just, it was just spectacular. And in high school, uh, I did uh, three musicals, the leads of three musicals, and it was just such a magical 
part of growing up to have this event in the daily life that was, you know, I had a very good life and, and privileged and, and I'm grateful for it. But the, the spectacular part, which would jump out a once a year for two weeks or four or six weeks, whatever it was, was getting to do these plays, these musicals. It just was, it, it sounds corny as my son would say, to say it, but it was magic. It was just outside of the ordinary. It was extraordinary. It was uh, really remarkable. When I went to uh, ACT, American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, where I met my wife and I really started my professional life as an actor, the teaching that I had there, the teachers, literally, it, again, it sounds corny, uh, they changed my life. The, the idea of what a storyteller is, how profoundly fundamental to the human experience it is to tell stories, to have that uh, priestcraft, shaman, I hate to be pretentious, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the impulse of sitting around a fire, uh, you know, in the dark and telling stories, enacting the, the day's events, passing down culture and values and traditions among your people, your tribe, your community. Um, so the, those experiences happened to me in class in this building in San Francisco when I was not yet 20 or 21. And uh, that really, more than any one particular production, all of which have endless stories which will bore you and your listeners to tears, but <laughs> endless stories associated with every show, but it was, th it was that impulse, that... Um, connection of heart and mind and uh, feeling and thought, the intellectual challenge and the emotional connection uh, that really formed what I want to do and hope to accomplish as an actor. Is that really pretentious? Does that sound like I'm totally full of shit? No, not at all. No, you're talking as you love it. So <laughs> doing all this time, it's really inspiring for us. Um, well, uh, coming from a theater background, when you uh, first stepped onto like a professional film set, uh, what did you find it a little more challenging or different? Or were you just like amazed at the size of the production versus maybe a uh, theater acting in theater? Interesting. I there is a difference. Uh, it's a difference. It's a difference of degree as well as a difference of kind in terms of learning to act for the camera. The camera reads thought. The camera sees thought, and so you don't have to do as much as you would for a theater that has a second balcony or a a big space. Uh, uh, it's the containment and intensity of focus, which I think. It's interesting, I, I think the first thing I did on film, uh, other than commercials, which were very interesting, I think the first thing I did, uh, you're much too young to remember Alan Funt and Candid Camera, which was like the early punking people, pranking people with these events. Uh, and and Alan Funt was, was a thing, he was such a, icon of the of the late 60s 70s um i guess he was retired by the 70s and he did a reboot and i did that and i remember being on the set and and it was uh all that i hoped for and more but i'll tell you even more remarkably the first film i shot when i moved to la uh was a film called war games with matthew broderick i auditioned for it in san francisco the day my younger son was born, uh, the movie went into turnaround, which means the funding fell down, fell out, and they had to redo it. My original director, Marty Brest, was replaced by John Batham, and uh, the role had been cast by a friend of mine, Dakin Matthews, who's a brilliant actor. When I moved to, San, to Los Angeles, they said, oh, they're recasting it. So I, I got the role, and I was very happy. And what struck me was, 
how playful the set was, uh, how Matthew Broderick, who was young, and he's just, he was just wonderful. We'd seen him in New York, the Torch Chong trilogy with uh, Harvey Fierstein. Uh, and and it was that was a pleasure. But what really struck me, and this is the weird thing, is you know I woke up at five thirty in the morning. I drove to the we sh we shot it at an actual high school near uh, where we were living in Santa Monica, and I was home by two o'clock in the afternoon, rocking my younger baby son to sleep in his carriage. And I'm sitting there thinking, are you fucking kidding me? That was it. I, I shot a I shot a movie. I woke up. I got home. I'm home in time. To, that's it. <laughs> that you know, there was no like parade in front of my house when I got home. There was no one throwing confetti. No one really cared. Um, but the set itself, to the point of your question, was a playful. Uh, Matthew kept saying, "Please surprise me. Please uh, don't don't be afraid to change things up." Uh, and, and and the director was very kind. And from that moment, I was struck by one of the principal differences between film and television, theater, film and television, the, the collaboration with so many people. I mean, a film crew is hundreds of people. Within the room while you're shooting, probably 100 people, 60, 50, 40 at the, mo at the least. Uh, everyone has their own job and on assignment. But what amazed me was how much goes into creating that one minute or that 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 specific slice of the film, um, so those that that's really part of what it was. Yeah, that actually adds to the question that I want to ask you regarding War Games. So you're saying that John Batham directed your scene, not Martin Brest. Correct. Marty Brest was replaced. Okay. They may have shot some film, but I, I'm pretty sure Mar John Batham reshot all of it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I'm an actor. What the fuck do I know? What I know? <laughs> hey, uh, I'm allowed to curse on the podcast. Is that okay? Of course, yeah, by all <laughs> means. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, John Bottom, and he was so fun. I mean, it was it was so much fun. Uh, Ali Sheedy also was wonderful, and mm. uh, it was just so uh, playful, which I, I I wasn't really fully prepared for. Uh, and of course, every set is different. Every depending on who, you know, you know, they say the fish stinks from the head. So whoever's <laughs> in charge, you know, uh, sets the tone. If it's extremely serious, which is fine, or if it's extremely playful, or some uh, combination of the two. Adam was was remarkable. Really knew what he wanted. Very quiet. Very focused. Really made really contained and kind. It was yeah. It was great fun. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, I, 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 I always have a question about Brooklyn Bridge whenever we have an alumni or from that show um, uh, as a guest. Um, now, on that show, uh, I find, I, I'll admit, I haven't seen each and every one of the television shows you've been on. But your, your role in that, to me, showed, I guess, allowed you to have the most, I guess, full arc of a character that I've seen you do. And I, what I, I guess what it introduced to me as an audience member is I've never seen a regular character, I guess, on a show who had marital problems and could be a villain, but you can't help but like him, you know, because he is who he is despite everything. But yet you could see the character wanting to be better and apologetic. So um, I first, I just want to say thank you for that. And, um, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and also, I just want, uh, I guess since you had been on Family Ties seven times before with uh, Gary David Goldberg and director Sam Weissman, did they uh, envision you for the role? Did you have to audition? What was the process in getting on Brooklyn Bridge and being on the show? Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you. Uh, it was one of the greatest experiences of my life uh, to this uh, I mean to this day I mean I've had some great great times uh, and, and I've been lucky to have really remarkable collaborators and people who've given me the opportunities to work Gary David Goldberg was so important in my life um, one of the first early TV shows I got was Family Ties 
in their first or second season. And uh, I, I, Gary gave me, I don't remember, seven ep episodes or something like that. And I remember the the third episode, the third episode that was the, one of the episodes of Family Ties. I came in, and and he said to me, "Listen, we're at a point in our relationship. I I don't want you to think that uh, I I don't believe in you or respect your work. I just need your audition." And I'm like a schmuck, but I, you know, I'm a fucking I'm a guest star actor. I mean, I've been lucky to do work, but as a like, guy, I'm de uh, delighted to audition for you, honored to audition. What Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, is holds such a dear place in my life. I did not audition for Brooklyn Bridge. Um, they knew when I came in, it was 92 was my first season I shot, the summer of 92. I was also playing Falstaff in Ojai and I was rehearsing something in Topanga and I was shooting Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Bridge. When I came in, Brad Hall, who's a brilliant writer, Married to Julie Louis Dreyfus, who's also brilliant. Um, and I don't say that glibly. I think they're extraordinary. I came and said, Oh, no, we, we, knew, we knew we were going to use you uh, back in May. And I'm sitting there thinking, Why the fuck didn't you? You know, a phone call would have been <laughs> like, Hey, don't worry about it. You have a job coming up in the fall. Uh, and, you know, I never said that, of course. Um, but I did not audition for it. And I, I have to say, it. It, it is one of the great experiences of my life. It was such a, um, it was such a Jewish show, but it was appreciated by every ethnicity that I've ever met who live in an intergenerational ex environment, either in one house that contains grandparents, parents, and children, or in a in the case of Gary's show where we were living in an apartment building with the grandparents on one floor, the children on another. And I've spoken to families from Korean families and Hispanic families and black families. You know, it's like, oh yeah, no, that was like my grandmother. My, that was my, that was my grandfather. That was my uncle. Uh, that experience, the universality of it, I always believe the more specific you make the work, the more universal the appeal of a piece of art is. It's, it's through the specificity of the, of the story and, and what you're telling and what, what's connected to your heart in the telling of that story. Um, that show, my greatest regret was that we didn't get to do more episodes. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought in the okay. last episode, Gary said, listen, just come on in. Uh, next season, we'll make you a regular. I did, uh, you know, you're, you're a valued guest. Uh, I love you to be here. We just want to finish up the season. I said, well, of course, I'll do anything you want, ever. Uh, and I knew walking around the set that day, I just thought they're just not going to pick us up. And part of the problem was, you know, it was, uh, we shot a lot of film. We shot, there's that, am I allowed to say all this? We shot, we had years ago. I mean, Sam Weisman, I love him. I lost track. Of, he went back east. He was teaching at Brandeis. Um, what? We shot, there was a table scene, a, di a dinner scene where we were all there and where we were, um, I, I had to, I was eating baba ganoush, which was actually one of my favorite things. Um, I ate fucking, I must have eaten two pounds of that fucking baba, because I'm such an idiot, I don't eat, you know, I have a food issue anyway. We shot, I, I want to make, make up the 200,000 feet of film. I mean, we didn't shoot that much, but we just shot for hours. Well, let's do it again. I want to do another one. Give me an chance. And I, I think some of the, um, I think some of that may have contributed to them not giving us another season. It was a very expensive show. Uh, you know, for, for a half hour show, you're allowed to shoot for uh, seven or eight days. And for an hour show, you're allowed to shoot for 10 days. Uh, I think every half hour episode we did was 10 days of shooting. We just loved work. We loved each other. Louis Zorich, uh, who was Olympic, married to Olympia Dukakis, who was the grandfather. Amy Aquino, who's a magnificent. Peter Friedman, one of the great New York stage actors. Uh, I mean, th these, th this cast, and the woman who played my wife, Natalia Nobly, we had such a f family feeling on that set. Um, anyway, I could go on and on forever. And I'm so grateful that you brought it up because it is 
I remember years later, 92, 93, I was certainly over by 94, because I, I was in New York doing a, a play. But I did a show probably in the late 90s, a TV show, and the costumer, Linda Bass, was had done Brooklyn Bridge. And we all we talked about while costuming this other show was how much fun we had on Brooklyn Bridge. I mean, it was just, uh, thank you for bringing it up. It, it uh, warms the cockles of my heart. To <laughs> times. It was so much fun. Yeah, um, it's certainly a classic series and one that, you know, we had hoped would have more series to come, but we actually talked to David Wall about it recently. So, you know, definitely check that out when you have a chance. Um, so, of course, I need to say one thing. Uh, yeah. Gary Goldberg, for Family Ties, for example, he had what he called the Goldberg Players. And he would bring us back year after year. Now, you're not allowed to do that a lot. You know, that almost never happens in television. You do television, unless you come back as the same character, when you do a show, you're done. You burn the show, you can't usually do it again. Gary would bring us back year after year and different <laughs> characters. He just, didn't, he just loved being with us. But there's a particular episode of Aunt Trudy's Funeral, uh, played by the wonderful uh, uh, Barry, what's her first name? Barbara Barry, what a gorgeous actor. Um, she dies and they're having a garage sale and I come to the garage sale and they invite me to her funeral. So if anyone has a chance to watch that episode, it epitomizes Gary Goldberg's writing where you have deep humor, funny, based in character, based in situation and deeply moving emotional stuff about a family grieving for a beloved aunt. And that mix of comedy and, I mean, that, it was around that time that they were coining the phrase, it's a dramedy, a drama and comedy. I mean, like they needed a fucking name for it. You know, it's like, <laughs> you just can't call it a human story where there's, because that's what our lives are, right? It's a balance of, you know, you're in the middle of something funny and then something horrible happens or, you're in the middle of a funeral and people are laughing because they're telling stories about the person who died. And, and it's always, and I think that mix, that's what makes us human. So I, I just, he was really a special man. I, and his daughter, uh, Dana, has carried on the tradition. She's a writer and a producer in television. I have not worked with her yet. I mm -hmm. hope I'll have the chance someday to tell her thank you on for her dad. But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So of course, uh, with our show, we have a lot of horror fans, so we can't like actually leave you until we ask you about Friday Thirteen Part Six. Jason lives. Um, all I'm going to ask is, uh, <laughs> what do you remember most about playing Larry the Paintball Guy? And did you actually play paintball prior to the movie? We did play paintball, not prior, while we were there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One of the problems is it makes a mess. You know, you shoot, it hits, and then they have to watch the costume. Um, so there were several things about that. First of all, it was great fun. The director, whose name I forgot, uh, got it. He was wonderful. He ran the, San, the Los Angeles Mime Troop. Uh, he was a, a kind, open-hearted, gentle man. He wrote the script. Um, so th there were several things. One was they had to make a cast of our head for the gag where they chop our heads off. Um, and they did a body cast and a head cast. That was the first time I'd ever done that. Where they wrap you with uh, uh, that uh, the gauze that has plaster of Paris infused in it. And then they wet it and then it makes a thing and you breathe through these two straws in your nose. Um, and uh, it was really fun. I wanted to take the head and have it home. <laughs> I was going to serve it to my mother on a platter. I thought that was funny. Um, but Frank Mancuso Jr. was the head of Paramount at the time. The rumor was he kept all that memorabilia in a in a storage unit somewhere. I don't know if he's long since gone. I don't know if he, if, if, where, where that stuff was. So that, that was remarkable. On the plane ride going to Georgia, you know, they fly you first class. So we're there with a bunch, bunch of us. Uh, well, I'm going because what an opportunity to do blah, blah. The actors we're talking to. I said, come on, guys. We've got a fucking job. 
<laughs> a flying first class. We're doing a, a movie in a really beloved uh, movie series. It's going to be fun. But when we got there, we were using the churchyard's grave site, cemetery. And they couldn't <laughs> tell them that we were doing a horror movie because there was a sacrilege involved. So when I got there, there was a thing like, you know, this way to the set for The Eagle Has Landed. And I, I'm Mr. Big Mouth Schmuck. I'm like, what the fuck is that? What is The Eagle Has Landed? Ow, shut up. <laughs> uh, it turns out, so no, we're shooting, but we can't tell them that we're making a Friday the 15th movie because it was not religious. Um, but again, the director, oh God, I wish I remember his name. I'm sure you can look it up anyway. Uh, you're like, are you everybody okay? Are we all right today? Would you like some tea? Are you, you feeling okay? Good. Sleep well? Good. All right. So let's set up. This is the scene where we're going to cut your head off. And so the, the juxtaposition between his gentle, inclusive kindness and the violence of the scene. I also learned how they work in how it sometimes works in violent movies. You're allowed to show the machete going back. You're allowed to show the machete going out. But you can't show the cut. Mm. Right? That's whatever. Now, that may have changed. So they would shoot stuff that the sensor board would eliminate just in order to say, okay, we're gonna, we'll, we'll give you that, but we want to keep these two things. So they would shoot things that they knew were going to be censored in order to gain something that they wanted that might have been on the line. So that's an interesting bit of politics that I didn't, I was not aware of at the time. Um, and some of some of these people who became good friends, Vinnie Gustafaro and Cindy Kane, who have become very good friends. Uh, we were in that movie together and uh, it was really fun. And I'm amazed, I shouldn't be, because I don't watch horror movies, they scare me. Uh, <laughs> they really do. I was in the ring also, and I, I mean, mm -hmm. when we went to the screening, I was under the fucking seat. <laughs> I was just making fun of me. I said, I said I, this is, when that little girl crawled up out of the well, oh, I was going to throw up. I just, so I was really amazed by how popular Friday the 13th is, the, the whole, that whole series of, of movies. Uh, the most fan mail I get is for people from Friday the 13th. Oh, so, mm -hmm. And if anyone's li listening, I'd love to go to one of the horror conventions. <laughs> We'd love to see you at one. <laughs> yeah. Be a blast. Um, uh, my question is, bringing back your like theater background, when you uh, were in the A Midsummer's Night dream film, um, was that a particular joy getting to play that role, since you do have such an extensive theater background? Indeed, yes. Uh, the joy was manifold. The director, uh, who has gone on to do other work now, I don't think he's doing that. He's not making movies anymore. I had done his uh, USC graduate film. Um, and uh, Franz, uh, who played Bottom, he's mm -hmm. done a lot of, of TV and stuff like that. Uh, so Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, the first time I did Midsummer Night's Dream, I have done, I, I have aged through that play and then come back full circle to bottom. The first time I did the play was in uh, 1981 in uh, uh, Gen Geneva, Illinois. A, a, a woman who became a dear friend, she's since has died, Marianne McGarry. She was so lovely. Uh, she stood at a summer theater. And she wanted to do Midsummer Night's Dream. And my wife uh, was, is, there, are, am I too long winded here with these stories? No, not at all. We'd love to hear this. Uh, my wife went back to Illinois for her uh, sister's high school graduation. And while she was there, she found out that they were auditioning for the play of Midsummer Night's Dream. And she auditioned, in the, and the woman, and Marianne said, I'd like to cast you as Hermia. She played opposite Dan Castellaneta, by the way. Mm -hmm. Homer Simpson, and who was fantastically funny. Uh, and Kathy said, yes, I'd love to play Hermia, but, you know, my wife, my husband's an actor, and uh, there was a writer's strike coming up, 
we, I'd like, so by, on the strength of my wife's audition, the woman cast me as um, uh, uh, Oberon, which I'm not a, I mean, Oberon is usually tall, gorgeous, you know, it's, it's the, he's the male, uh, uh, mature male lead. And I said to her, you know, I, I'm not the typical, this was before Zoom, so she couldn't see what I looked like. I said, I'm a little fat, squatty guy. So I don't want you to think you're going to get some tall, thin, you know, Howard Keel, and in comes, you know, uh, this little, uh, short, little stubby guy. Um, and I had a lot of fun doing that. I've since done Bottom three or four times. Um, I, I did Aegeus uh, for that film. Uh, and and uh, Hamish Linkletter, who is the son of Kristen Linkletter, who is one of the great voice coaches of all time. Uh, she's magnificent. Uh, we studied her work at ACT in San Francisco when we were there. Her son was in the film and his wife at the time, who was still married, Lily Ray, who was David Ray's daughter, were, were in the film. So working with them was, was a privilege and a pleasure. Uh, but yes, having done the film, I, after having done the play, was really interesting. And what I talked about before about how you, uh, the difference between stage performance, which has to reach a further audience, and film performance where you can really focus just on having your eye contact to the people who, who are in the lens. Uh, I had learned quite a bit about that. So by the time we did the film, uh, I think I was more successful at doing some of that. Uh, you know, they, they said to James Earl Jones once, he's done a fellow eight times. And they said, how is that? He said, well, during the last run of the eighth performance, I was beginning to figure out what that role is. And, and to me, the humility uh, of that and the beauty of that in terms of not, a, not only understanding Shakespeare, but understanding stage work and understanding film work, it just takes a long time. It's a process. Um, and I was grateful for the director of that film because he put Put my character, the character I played, in more scenes than he is in the in the play. In the play, he's in the first scene and he threatens to kill his daughter. Then he's in at the end. So there's a lot of green room time. You know, we're down in the green room playing cards and watching TV or whatever you do in the green room. So uh, I'm, you've done thorough research to know that that film was part of my. Uh, <laughs> my Please try to. <laughs> Plus. Uh, you know, as a fan, I'm going to <laughs> try to watch any film that has some of my favorite actors in it. And, um, uh, just uh, one more, uh, well, not one more question overall, uh, but um, in the movie Tin Man, you know, that is, uh, your career is starting, you know, you're getting to be more recognized, and here you are on a set with all these, like, character actors, you know, you're under the direction of Barry Levinson, whose writing is like more theatrical and conversational rather than plot driven. But when you're working on that film and you're with, you know, a Bruno Kirby, you know, a Richard Dreyfuss, a Danny DeVito, at that point, did you see them more as, you know, like contemporaries, even though, you know, they're a little more popular? Or was it more, I'm just, you know, let me sit in the background and soak it all in? Well, uh, sort of both. You know, uh, it, I can summarize it with two things. We had dinner, um, you know, so there were two teams. I was on Danny's team. Uh, I was on Richard Dreyfuss' team, and then there was Danny's team. Uh, and we had dinner one night with uh, Barry and Levinson and Danny DeVito and Barbara Hershey and Richard Dreyfuss and Seymour Cassell and Bruno Kirby. And I ex this is you know, 86, 84, 85, 86. Or I excused myself from the table and went to the payphone to call my wife. In, we were shooting in Baltimore. I called my wife in LA to say, I'm having fucking dinner with Danny DeVito and Richard Dreyfuss and Barry Lebs. Can you believe this? Uh, then I went back, tried to be cool. Uh, it was the biggest film I had done at the time. It was the biggest project I had done at the time. It was a spectacularly interesting project. 
Uh, Barry Levinson is quite brilliant and uh, his writing is, is just delicious. Uh, you know, Dreyfus was fantastic. He's such a, he'd been a hero of mine obviously for years. Uh, and he loves to rehearse. He said, come into my trailer, let's go over these lines. He's constantly rehearsing. Um, and and he he was just it, it was it was beyond it was beyond joy it was the, the most joyful uh, in, in 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 so many ways uh, my kids came to visit the set from New York uh, uh, from California they through New York they came down to visit and uh, my younger son who at the time was maybe uh, five uh, comes over and, I, and jumps into Richard Dreyfuss's arms. Like, what the fuck are you doing? This is Richard's <laughs> movie star. And Travis was cool. He, he, you know, he was very sweet about it. Um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was, it felt like, okay, this now I feel like, now I feel like I'm in the big leagues. If I can continue doing this. Uh, the other thing that happened was my first shot was me on a uh, balcony looking down at the, uh, uh, they were having a hearing mm -hmm. uh, where they're licensed. And I, I went up there, you know, to the top and I'm standing there, put my hands in my pockets and I'm looking down thinking, wow, this is amazing. I'm shooting a movie. I just got here. This is going to be a minute. Cut, print it. We got it. And wait a minute. I wasn't ready. I wasn't acting. I was, I didn't even know you were doing it. And, and, in some ways, that's the you know that was the that's the beauty part of filmmaking, and Barry Levinson used to do that. He used to shoot with a long lens, with the camera way in the corner, and he would just shoot groups of us talking among ourselves because he was looking for the most authentically natural, non-acty, just be in the moment, live, living experience. Um, yeah, that that to me was an indicator. You know, I, I I wish I could say that from there it was you know just uh, more glorious roles. That may be one of the best roles I've ever had, actually, in terms of the size and scope of that film. That was a it. It actually was not a huge commercial success in terms of his Baltimore series. Avalon was a bigger hit, as was uh, Diner was a much bigger in terms of commercial success. Uh, but for me, it's a highlight. And it, it it made me feel like okay now I can I can hang with the bigs you know this was this, these guys I I I I belong here. Yeah, so you know we also do a lot of episodes where we do deep dives on films that we grew up on and. One of the movies that you were in that we did an episode on was Worth Winning with Mark Harmon, and you played Leslie Ann Warren's husband in it. Uh, what do you remember about that and working with them? The be, the, you know, listen, I, I sound like I'm a fucking, you know, I, I'm a bigger fan than most of the fans. I just fucking love it. You know, Mark Harmon was so fun and relaxed and easy. Uh, I, I, you know, he was just amazing. Uh, Leslie Ann Warren, I mean, I'll say this, you know, I, I, people said, you know, I got to be careful, you know, she can be very difficult. Now, if she'd been a guy, they never would have said that, you know, she was not difficult. She was magnificent. I, I met her before we should have said, you know, I'm just so happy to be with you. I think you're gorgeous. I've, no, I've seen your stuff since uh, she was in Cinderella. I don't know if you remember that uh, Disney thing. She's been a star forever. So, you know, I just fell in love with her. So, and I told her and she, so we got along fantastic. And again, during the takes, take after take from her, of her with me behind the camera, she was great, mix it up, change it up, do different stuff, surprise me. Don't let it get, you know, uh, stale. Uh, so she was great fun. Also, you know, I have to say, oh God, uh, Mark, um, Oh, Mark Blum. Oh, yeah. He died, you know, during COVID. He was, so, he's a real uh, fixture in uh, New York theater, and he taught at Brooklyn uh, College. He taught theater. Uh, he, he was such a joy uh, to get to know and to work with. 
if, if that was good. I think Brad Hall was in that also as one of the guys, uh, one of uh, the poker guys. Uh, you know, I'll tell you that that movie, if he had actually fucked that, the younger one, the virgin, the movie would have had to have him killed, right? Yeah. <laughs> to, it's one thing to defraud all the other women, but to take the most, uh, you know, protected and sweetest and then deceive her. Now we've moved from comedy into, well, nowadays you'd never make that movie. Just no. Inappropriate. <laughs> a tragedy. Because to me, there should be nothing inappropriate. That's the point of art is to disturb you. The point of art, we can call what we do art. And sometimes it is. Uh, but the point of it is to provoke and disturb, to push you beyond what you're comfortable with. To, to, to you know, your trigger warnings. This shit makes me crazy. You know, if uh, Judy Jens was just quoted uh, saying something like, oh, darling, if you're that fragile and sensitive, don't go to the theater because you're supposed to be shocked and appalled and provoked and angered and filled with joy and, and, and made to feel part of something greater. Uh, so that's my little rant on that. But uh, Carmen was great. And again, the, the, the director and the producer, Dale Pollock was the producer. Uh, you know, it, it comes from the top. Those guys were, let's have fun. And we were having fun. You know, it was just easy and relaxed. I'm not privy to were we going over schedule and were they worried about that. I just know that for the actor during the experience, it could not have been more pleasant. Okay, and speaking of disturbed, uh, Problem Child 2, I have to ask you about. <laughs> um, on the lighter side, I want to ask what it was like working with John Ritter. But my other question for you in the disturbing side is, what was really in that lemonade when you had to drink <laughs> it when it got replaced with you know what? <laughs> Everyone, that's one of the big questions. <laughs> drink a glass of tea. Uh, no, it was lemonade, uh, highly, uh, highly diluted. Uh, and um, John Ritter was great. He was really fun. Uh, the woman who became his wife, who was just starred in the movie with him, was also, she was great. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I will say, so I got to take my family to Gatorland in Tampa, which is a horrible city i i apologize for those people live in florida, florida in general what are you doing give me a i agree <laughs> i'm a friend of my partner's moving to georgia give me a fuck about i have dear friends there but who what the fuck is going on the world is <laughs> upside down anyway it was great fun to take them to gatorland the, the movie was a blast when i get blown up in the uh, barbecue uh, the Purdue, the Sid Scheinfeld, who was the president of Universal at the time, or chairman, or whatever his title was, he asked them to please reshoot and have me uh, land in a kiddie pool to show that I wasn't really killed or hurt. Because he didn't want it to, like, I think I get blown up. Now we've gone from comedy to, why did we kill that man? <laughs> So I went back for another day of shooting where I felt the gag was I fell off of a ladder. You don't see where I fall from into a kiddie pool so that you so that there's a splash now so that I didn't get blown up. Uh, and, and it's funny that you say it because I'll tell you that I, I said this, I guess, already. That's one of the big questions I get asked. Did you really have to drink a glass of tea? And it's like, honey, <laughs> uh, you know, there are things I will do for my career. That's not <laughs> Um, well, speaking of that, um, one of your biggest, most, well, I don't know if it's your most popular, but one of your bigger roles as kind of a co-lead is in the MTV movie Together. It, and uh, one of the things with that uh, movie, it became a series, and I, I know they explain at the end your character moved on to a different group, but were you ever offered a chance to I guess guest star or even be in the series. Oh, those motherfuckers didn't even tell me they were doing it. Oh man, I'm not bitter. Uh, so the director Nigel Dick, who's become a very dear friend, 
he's like the godfather of MTV videos. I don't know how much you you look up. He, he did Paul McCartney and Guns N' Roses and Britney Spears. And I mean, he's done everyone. And he used to break bands, Nickelback, when they were trying to break that band, they brought him in to do it. So that was a that was a spectacular process. Uh, it, you know, I was basically the lead of the film. I was in every single scene. And I know for a fact, well, I have no discretion at all, do I? Uh, I know for a fact that when they were cutting the movie, uh, one of the producers kept saying to the director, this is not about an old, bald, fat man. Cut back to the kids. Cut back to the So, you know, and, and I should have known. My wife said to me, honey, because at the end, they were doing all this publicity. Rolling Stone was there, and uh, Teen Beat, and all these. And I said, that nobody wants to interview me. And my wife said, Alan, what's wrong with you? It's a movie about five young, gorgeous guys uh, and Kevin Farley. Uh, <laughs> he's a great guy and very funny, but you know, uh, <laughs> not about an old fat bald man. Uh, but I will, and, and so that that was true. But they decided to make the, you know, I think I was a, I, I think that when they went to the series, my my opinion is. They decided to make sure the focus was just on the kids, just on the point. And you know, Michael Cuccioni died not long after. Yeah, he had been very ill, and his mom Gloria is very sweet, and we've stayed in touch indirectly and uh, sporadically. Uh, that was a huge, huge event. Those guys, uh, we really got to be pretty close during that shooting. Nigel Dick, I have to say again, if anyone who's ever worked with him, he is. He was, we got to be such good friends. He was so creative, so clever. Uh, I thought the movie was was really, really uh, better. It was one of the highest rated or one of the few highest rated MTV movies. And MTV stopped making long form movies after that. Very uh, soon after that, I guess they weren't as profitable. It's all about the do re mi, you know? It's all bottom line. So it's a business. My friend keeps saying, they don't call it show hobby. They call it show business. So don't be naive. Um, we were in Canada for uh, six weeks, eight weeks, six weeks. So it was it was really, really fun. It was, uh, you know, it was the first time I was in every scene. I was in everything. And it was such a, a, a joy to be, uh, take on that kind of responsibility. Because uh, I felt like I knew enough to, to do it at the time. Yeah, I was going to say, too, like, I, I just saw the movie recently on YouTube, and wow. I think it's a shame they didn't bring you back for the series, because I felt like you were the most interesting character. Like, your role could have easily have been like a villain, like, literally screwing over these kids, and you're not. You're very likable. Oh, yeah. I mean, I thank you so much. I didn't know you could see it on YouTube. Uh, so they have a thing in Canada called, uh, well, it's basically prepaid residuals. When you work, they give you your salary plus 105%. That's the ACTRA contract. So they're prepaying you for five years with the residuals. Uh, and if they want to bring it back, then they have to do that again for another five years, um, which they never did. Um, I have a copy of the film that my son found. Uh, so it's interesting that it's available on YouTube, but I guess all the rules are off now. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I could, it could have been, you know, I would have been happy to come back as, you, you, you know, you, you don't remember the Partridge family, but the their agent, their manager, he would come in one scene a show, you know, and just, he had very, it was about the family, it was about, you know, but I would have been happy to clap there once a week, and, you know, get to do an episode, but I never did, and that was too bad. Uh, and those kids, those kids, those young men now, Pretty remarkable, uh, pretty remarkable, uh, beautiful voices. Really, I thought I, I thought they were really good. It was it was a great experience all around. It was really fun. Yeah, I also um, before I get to you, Joe. So, I actually have to ask you a question about one of my heroes, which is Robert Townsend. He had directed you in Jackie's Back, and I was wondering what that experience is like because I've met Robert once and. He's the kind of guy that he will stop for like a whole half hour just to talk to you and give you advice. And I just think he's amazing. So I'd love to hear like what your thoughts were working with him. I, I completely agree with what you 
you said. He is that guy. He made us, he made me feel like I was central to the to the project. Um uh, 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 what's her name? Lewis, uh her first name. Oh, Jasmine Lewis. Yeah, she was a remarkable. Uh you know, th that whole experience was he made me feel central to the project. And I in many ways I was peripheral. I mean, I was, you know, I was part of the thing, but his again, his focus, his um, decisiveness, his vision for what was happening is what drove that thing through. And and I thought it was very funny and very successful. He he is he to me was one of the first hyphenate uh, right. I mean, because he started, he was a, he was a stand up, mm -hmm. and then, so always a writer. But then, as a then he became a filmmaker. But I think he was always a filmmaker. He's a storyteller in whatever medium he has. Yeah. I don't know where he is lately. I haven't seen him or heard about him in a while, uh, and I hope he's still making uh, films or projects of some kind. Because you know, he he just ran again. As I said, it it comes from the top. You know, you come in to a set like his where he's decisive, he's calm. He's in control. He doesn't yell at anyone. Every every note comes comes up to talk to you individually. Uh, always in a good mood. Always smiling. Always kind. It it's uh, it makes the difference between a good experience and a nightmare. Mm -hmm. So it brings it brings the best work to to the table, and I think that's what he did. Yeah, he's still working. By the way, he's doing episodes of Black Lightning and a lot of TV as of late. So he's still out there. I love Black Lightning. Oz Scott uh, was one of the. We just interviewed him recently. What a great man. Yeah. What a great man. President, he was president of the uh, uh, Directors Guild for Theater. For, he, he, yeah, he was. In, he probably told you all that he was instrumental in colored films. Uh, he was just. He is legendary to me. Again, well, he's also six five or six eight. Uh, and he directed me on several TV things. Again, calm, decisive, funny, at ease. Uh, yeah, just a genius, I think. Definitely. Um, you worked on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Well, also <laughs> I got cut out of the final episode. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, for whatever reason, that was set. I'm sorry, I, I cut you off. But we, no, no, no. Um, I was just gonna ask. You know, being more of a theater actor, was it more fun playing? You know, with improv, even though you know the scene has what points you're supposed to hit. Is it more challenging, more fun, or are you just like hanging on like a roller coaster by your knuckles when it comes to working like that? Not at all. No, it's fun. It's the great fun. It's joyful. The problem for me, and this is just me, Larry David's a kind of commodity genius. Uh, the show is hysterical. Uh, I'm a Jew, so it's deeply Jewish. I, I relate to it. Um, I will say, so my, and I'm cut out of the final version, but so the, the gag was uh, uh, we're at the locker room at the golf club and uh, the guy died. And I'm supposed to, and I, they tell me. And so they say, oh, you know, so, so he died. And I said, oh my God, that's terrible. Uh, how's his wife doing? Cut. Don't mention the wife. Oh, okay. Uh, let's, let's do it again. So I, know, I said, oh my God, that's horrible. Are the kids okay? Cut. Don't mention the kids. So here's my problem. You guys have all agreed what the parameters are. You forgot to tell me. So how am I going to improvise around it if there are, if there's a box around which I don't know what's inside? I don't know where the playground is. I don't know what I'm supposed to leave out. Or so my experience was not as happy because I didn't know what I was supposed to or not supposed to do. Uh, the guys were great. Ted Danson was guest starring, and uh, so he was around. And I'd done a bunch of uh, Cheers, and I did a couple of episodes of his other show, Becker. Uh, so I, I find him delightful and open and uh, humble and elegant and funny. Um, but, but that, 
that was the that was the one experience I was like, God damn, what if you told me what the parameters are, I could have done more and then maybe I wouldn't have gotten cut out. So I was a little grumpy about that, I guess. That's the grumpy part of my interview. Okay. Um <laughs> stay on that same kind of wavelength. Another show you did or were a recurring guest star on was uh Gilmore Girls, where you know, the dialogue is more fast paced like a classic movie. Um, with that, was it challenging or was that like more right up your alley? Because you get to say more in, in such a short amount of time. That was right up my alley. That was so well written. You know, it's not a question of the pace. It's a question of how well written it is. If it's extremely well written, the pace comes naturally. It's inherent in the rhythm of the writing. Uh, she, I think, Amy Sh uh, Sh uh, Palladino is, is a genius. Uh, I, I would have loved to have been on uh, Maisel. Uh, Saul Rubin played the role I wanted to play, which was the head of the, when they go up to the Catskills to the resort. Saul Rubin is a wonderful actor. I would have loved to have done that role. Gilmore Girls, uh, so the guy who played the minister, Jim Jansen, mm -hmm. and I, we got along fantastically well from the first day. And so we were just playing and having fun the first scene we shot was in the uh, diner with uh, the actor's name is Michael Winters. And I'd known him through theater friends. And so, uh, oh my God, you know, when you're a guest, it's all about getting invited in and being included and being welcomed. That was so much fun. But she is such a good writer. There was one scene in the park where they're dragging around bales of marijuana and she decided to have the priest and the rabbi walk through, it was a walk through, it was a half a page, walk through discussing God and the aspects of God. Literally, we shot in, I don't know, a couple of hours, half a day, half a page. It's unusual, just from a budget point of view, to bring two actors in to have a half page of dialogue just to set the context of the world, that kind of attention to detail is what I think makes her so, so brilliant. Um, I've never seen the show. I see nothing about it. <laughs> and and I, it, it, the other story I'll tell is I had uh, snapped my bicep tendon. I had surgery and I had a cast and I didn't know what to wear, you know, because uh, I couldn't put any, I couldn't bend my arm couldn't wear a suit jacket. And I was worried that, you know, oh my God, how am I going to audition with a cast on my arm? Went in and got the audition, got the job, went to the set. They said, okay, we have some clothes for you to try and we have these suit jackets. I said, I can't wear a suit jacket. I have a cast on my arm. Oh, no one even noticed that I had a cast on my arm. <laughs> that was the last time I ever worried about what should I wear to an audition. Because they're, oh, they're looking like this. They're looking at the zoo. They're looking at, you know, <laughs> they do, they're like, oh, look, oh, God, he has a uh, he has a tear in his shirt. They don't give a shit. They just want, you know, they want to see what you're, what you're acting in. So, yeah, I love that show. I thought she, the writing every time we did it was just brilliant. Brilliant. Agreed. <laughs> So I have just like one more movie related question because I know you got an extensive filmography. There's so much we could talk to you about, but I know time is a little limited. Uh, but I got to ask you about Righteous Kill. I mean, it's got its issues, but you work with some heavy hitters in that, you know? So Pacino, De Niro, John Leguizamo, like what was that like? So my agent calls me up and says, uh, you have to go to the director's office we're going to do a table read of the film, which is very unusual for, for my experience was. Uh, and I just want you to know, Al Pacino, Al Pacino, I'm going to do this. And I said, why are you whispering? <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a phone call. Nobody's tapping my phone. Uh, so, I mean, that, so that was, you know, I've never met those guys. Uh, you know, so Pacino's lying, sitting back. He's got a black uh, sweatshirt. He's, you know, he's, he goes, hey, he's sitting there. How are you? Yeah, Pacino said, yeah, it'd be great to meet you. <laughs> yeah, I'm 
Albertino. And De Niro sitting there wearing a short sleeve polo shirt with glasses on a on a wire around his neck. This is a Bob. This. So um, <laughs> I spent the whole reading just watching that. How do they approach it? What's that like? Because I'd never worked with those guys before. They were very, I mean, Al Pacino is much more, uh, he's much more loosey-goosey. He's much more trying to find the truth in the thing before he does it. Uh, Dino was very, uh, it sounds weird, business-like. You know what I mean? He's, he was, do the work, say the words, find the truth as you say it. Uh, really, just remarkable. Now, I, my scene was with Leguzamo. Uh, and he was funny, relaxed, inclusive, wanted to rehearse. We were shooting in, in uh, Bingham, Binghamton? No, uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts. I, I don't remember the city, but it was a very uh, Central American population. He stayed, we shot till 11 at night. He stayed till 2 in the morning and signed every CD, every DVD, every... You know, people came out, hey, John. And he just was, that was a lesson to me in humility and connection to your family. We do the work and have the privilege of doing these stories because it reaches the audience. It has an effect on people in the world. And we need to be aware of it. And we need to be uh, respectful and, and, and treat our audience with kindness and love because it's the exchange we don't even know we shoot something it goes out into the ether and people have this whole experience of it uh and it's it's so important uh and i'll just tag on that by saying so i, I shot uh, two episodes of a show uh called uh hunters playing al pacino's rabbi my first job after covid the first thing they shot at the new amazon studios here in Culver city um, so, and I'll try to make it short. My line is, how are you, my friend? And he says, his line is, I'm a little out of sorts. I'm a little out of sorts today. But okay. So we start shooting. I say, how are you, my friend? And he says, oh, oh, you noticed. Oh, I didn't think anyone would notice. You know, I'm just not feeling myself. You know, I, I don't feel things are not uh, so good. I mean, I'm a little out of sorts. I feel so. I'm thinking this is gold. He's going to go around. This is what people der derisively call method acting. He's going to go around a little bit to figure out how to say the words with as much truth and honesty as possible. I love it. I, I'll play with you all day long. Not every actor does that, but he does. And he's 84, 86, whatever the fuck, just had a baby. Yeah. <laughs> he's all just had a baby. I mean, I mean, I have enough money, the kid's going to be fine, but it's not really fair. Actually. None of my business. God bless. Do what you do. Um, so then we get to my side, and I start stretching it out a little bit. The director says, cut. Alan, move it along. Oh, <laughs> I can't do that because I'm Alan Blumenthal, I'm not Al Pacino. Well, we're doing it. He says, cut. It comes to me. He says, make Pacino go faster. And I'm thinking, are you out of your fucking mind? This is Al Pacino. How am I going to? So, okay. So I'm improvising with him. I'm cutting him off. I'm throwing him another line. I'm trying to lead back to the, and he just goes with it. He's just there for the, you know, he's there for the dance. He's there for the ride. He, he's there for the process. And the result will be excellent. And that was a huge lesson in, 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 in acting. It was really, that was a privilege. And that comes out of the righteous kill. I said to him, you know, we met before I worked with you. He said, oh, here it goes. I said, no, no, you were right. Uh, he said, oh, that was 11 years ago. I said, was it that long ago? He said, oh, at least. Um, he, he was it was just he and I all day for a whole day just he and I across the table it was a such a fucking blast it was one of the highlights of my of my career I mean. as uh, we're winding down 
are there any roles that maybe we would be shocked that you maybe had to turn down? And because again, you're always so busy, it seems it's like, what do you turn down? And I don't turn, I don't, I don't think I've ever turned down a role. I mean, when I first came to LA, I met Ed Begley Jr., who I have great respect for, the one black kid. He said, just keep working. Just keep working. Work leads to work. You know, uh, I've done lots of low budget stuff. I've done AFI films, you know, uh, American uh, Film Institute, and student films, USC Master's Project. I just did one last year for a, a recent graduate of USC Film School. Uh, she was lovely, really smart, clever, good writer, very, uh, very insightful woman, uh, young woman, really terrific. Um, I don't turn shit down. So if anyone's listening and wants to give me a job, uh, yeah, I mean, I like to work. I like to work. It's uh, As a cisgendered white man of a certain age, I'm not the flavor of the month. I'm not, and I believe in diversity. I want more voices. I'm all about it. I just like another job. Uh, <laughs> I don't turn down. I mean, it would have to be, it would have to be like a commercial for the army. So, I'm, I'm not a pacifist. My wife is a pacifist. I would not like to encourage people to join the army. I mean, we need an army and blah blah blah. And politics, we can go have a drink sometime and talk politics. Um, but no, I've never turned anything down. I'm I'm open to work. I I I, I look forward to new experience. I want to learn. I'm curious. Okay. I'm a filmmaker myself, so you know you're definitely going to be on my list when we have something. Um, I'm, I, I guess one more question, uh, Andre, and then uh, yeah, yeah. do you ever take a vacation? Honestly, <laughs> work so much. <laughs> we just uh, every well every uh, every Memorial Day, our family we we rent a house in Palm Springs, and we go. We're going to go this year again. Uh, the last several years before COVID, my wife and I took a three-week vacation to Italy, to uh, England, and to uh, Greece. And this year, we're going to do a month in Scandinavia. Uh, we started planning it in 2020, and then COVID, and then COVID, and fucking COVID, fuck, 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 fuck. Uh, but this year, we're going to do it, and we've committed to doing a three-week month vacation every year for the next as many years as as the good Lord will allow me to keep uh, being alive. Uh, I, I love to travel. The most delicious thing, other than family, travel is the best thing there is. I, I read a horrible statistic. I don't know if it's true, so I'll repeat it. Um, that only 17% of Americans have passports. And that's mm -hmm. horrifying. Because that shows why, why we're so insular and ignorant about the world. Uh, you have to you have to meet other people. You have to be exposed to other cultures. You have to be challenged. You know, uh, you've got to learn and be out there in the world. So, so yes, I'm committed to more vacations. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to kind of wrap it up with just like two questions in one. Tell us about your program, Active Communication, and where can people find you if they want to follow you, see your stuff. Uh, alanblumenfeld.com is my website. I'm, I'm on Facebook, and I do not. I'm not on Instagram or Twitter or anything like that. Active communication. We started 46 years ago, uh, applying the skills of the actor, writer, and director to the needs of the trial lawyer, both in and out of court. How to tell stories. How to connect with jurors. Uh, how, how to understand how people learn, how people process information. Um, and we've had the privilege of working mainly with the plaintiff bar, but also with a lot of intellectual property and a lot of commercial litigation uh, for a long time, helping people who have been injured or hurt um, or killed by products and, and uh, bad behavior in the marketplace. We're selling the business this year but actofcommunication.com is the website. You can learn all about the company. The company is thriving. We're passing it along to a, a team of five people and our partner. Uh, and we'll be around for the rest of this year. And then we're going to commit ourselves to doing more theater and film and television. And we're going to produce my wife's plays and hang out with the grandkids. Nice. Um, 
Yeah, well, I guess uh, that is brings us, unfortunately, to an end of this interview. But thank you, Mr. Alan Blumenfeld, for being with us. We obviously are huge fans of yours. I know anybody who watches this show is definitely a fan of yours. And we didn't get to all our questions. So hopefully, uh, when you have time, you can come back and we'll, we have plenty of more questions and you can tell any story you want as long as you want, because it's just so engaging. Because again, we grew up watching you in various projects and it's just amazing to us that we're sitting here getting to talk to you at all. And we want to thank you for being with us. It really means a lot to us. It, it was a real great pleasure, you guys. You're wonderful. And, and anytime you, you want me back, I'd be happy to do it. Yeah, thank and you. thank you again for coming on and being an inspiration, being somebody that, you know, you've had this dream since you were a child and you're still sticking with it today. I mean, that really means a lot to us. Yeah, and yeah. Maker, uh, AJ, you got something for me? Give me a call, I'm there. Absolutely. Love it. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. All right, take care. Well, that ends this uh, episode, or that ends this week's business. But, you know, we always have unfinished business and more people to talk to and more guests to appreciate. Thank you for joining us in this episode. We'll see you next time. We bid you adieu. If you like this review, please be sure to like and hit subscribe to be alerted to new episodes in the future.